Welcome to week three. Um, hopefully you're all enjoying reading your textbook. If you haven't picked it up and started reading it, it sucks to be you. Uh, you're behind about 60 to 100 pages. Just putting it out there. Um, chapter three and four really suck to get through. Wasn't too bad reading, but you know. Uh, yeah, no. Then you got the history lesson. Congratulations. This week we're talk we're tackling one of the worst topics for a database. It's the topic I hate teaching the most. Um, but it's an important concept to understand. It's just really brutal to explain. Um, this is to also prepare you for your next lab. Those of you that haven't had lab three yet. This is for lab four, so don't panic. This is for basically next week's lab, but for the ones that have their labs on Tuesdays, it's, you know, down by one. Now, normalization. Normalization is a process. It's made up of normal forms. Every couple of years, they keep adding new ones. Why? because those professors in California got to keep themselves employed. However, there are some basic ones we all use. There's the first normal form, the second normal form, the third normal form, and now we're going to explain why this is done. Those are the common three. There's actually one past this that is also commonly used, and it's known as Boyce Cod. Um, I'll be covering that one towards the end of the class. Now, the purpose of the normal forms is to clean up broken data. Now, right now, if I look at this form, you'll see that they have, it's a class list. And there's a couple of different sections, some different people in each of them, and some different students. Now, this design, or this table is currently what they call unnormalized. There's issues with it. And I'll introduce you guys to, and I think I might have done it with you guys, but I'm not 100% sure, <laughs> um, the notation that's used when you're normalizing. It's called the relational notation. And it's only used really for normalization at a very basic level. Oh, there's a brush on top. Now, this sounds familiar, please stop me. But the way it works is entity name, square bracket, and then in here you have attributes. What's special is the primary key is underlined. And these are functional dependencies. They're put in, in curlies. I'll explain what functional dependencies are in a minute. All right, so there's the list, just so you can reference that as I'm going through this. Now, the definition of first normal form is when the primary key determines a single value for each of the attributes for all attributes in the relation. What a terrible explanation. And actually, I think the book does a better job of it. But this is the classic definition of first normal form. It's very wordy. However, it's basically what it's saying is that any given value for each of the attributes, for all attributes, belongs, there's one row of data per. So when you look at this right now, you've got a subject code, a section, an institution number, an instructor name, a subject name, a student number, but there's two of them in student name, and there's two of them. 
currently this is unnormalized. To be able to get to the first normal form, I'm just going to skip to the next slide. What we need to do is we need to break down what we had before into two pieces. So if I go back for a second, you'll see that student number and student number here is one, two, one, two, and down and down, and the repetitions are here. Looking for something. Nope. No, eventually I'm going to stop pulling things out of here and I'm going to get to what I want. Oh, huh, there it is. Right here. You'll see there's a repetition here, repetition here, but there's no matching chunk of data going across here that goes with it. So this is considered unnormalized. There are what's called a repeating group in each of the rows. So this is one row, but there's a repeating group of data. To get the first normal form, we have to get rid of the repeating group. If you look at it here, what we've done now is we've duplicated this chunk here so that each row is completely self-contained onto itself. That's called being in first normal form. That means there's no gaps in your data. So when you look at the data and you look at a table of data, there's no open cells. I know I've asked in the past, how many of you have used Excel? How many have used a spreadsheet of some sort? Okay, good. You know when you look at a spreadsheet and you got an empty cell in the middle of your spreadsheet? You don't want that. In other words, picture this as a spreadsheet and there are no empty cells anywhere. If there are no empty cells anywhere and everything is self-contained in each of their specific columns, as such, it's in first normal form. It's still full of holes and gaps and problems, but theoretically at least you're dealing with complete sets of information as opposed to gappy information. So in the end, what we want to achieve is we want to add a key of unnormalized relation to ensure primary key identifier, one and only one of each attribute. So what that's saying is Right now we got something called candidate keys and in here we have this could be a candidate key um, you know the instructor might be a candidate key right here the instructor number uh, the student number might be in a candidate key and but the problem is we can take this plus this plus this and we can identify every single row so if we take the first column the second column the third well whatever one three and six together, we have a compound primary key. Based on those three pieces of information, we can find any row in there. It's still terrible and gross, but at least we can do that. So with that compound key, we're able to identify one row of information. So one set of data at a time. So what's happened is previously where the student number and name was in a set of curlies, they're not in a set of curlies anymore because they've been exploded out. Go ahead. I don't know. What, I guess you'll be able to see over the monitor. It's been exploded out. And you can see right here where they've decided that the primary key would be the subject code, the, the subject code, the section code, plus the student number would uniquely identify a student, notwithstanding the instructor. So in this case, they're saying this plus this lets me find a full row of data, which is fine, because the instructor is assigned to a section anyway, so it amounts to the same thing. If we were to reorganize it so things were a little cleaner, we could take all the primary keys and just shove them all to the front so that all the primary keys are at one end of the table. That's not as important, but that's roughly what it would look like. Now, that's approach one. And approach two is to restate the unnormalized relation without the repeating groups. So you basically 
restate it with the gaps. And you end up with something that looks like this, so that suddenly the repeating groups are taken right out. There's no repeating group anymore. So we got rid of the students completely. Took them, yanked them. So then we create a, a new relation that has the original one, which is the class list. And you create another relation with the suit number and the foreign keys assigned to it so that the section code and the subject code together plus the student number gives me a classless student. This isn't as common, this approach, uh, because you're skipping steps. The, uh, the previous method, which is to do this, is the consider the, you know, the proper way to do it. Some people will go to this method just because they can. After a while you get used to it, you can start bringing things down faster. Um, so in, the, in this case, instead of having one entity that has you know, multiple columns that are repeating, you end up with two entities, class list and class list student. Now there's the two subject codes. These are foreign keys. At this point, we're already defining foreign keys even though we don't really know what they're going to be. So like I said, this is actually skipping a couple of steps. It works, but it's, it's, you know, it's a little sketchy to do it that way because you can't guarantee that everything's going to make it across. Now, once we've gotten it looking like we did in that nice table where all columns were full going across, we want to achieve what's called second normal form. Now, second normal form is in second normal form. It has to be in first normal form before you can be in second normal form. Right? It's sort of like how you can't be a super saiyan unless you went through the saiyan stage first. You can't be in second normal form unless you've achieved first normal form. That's just how it is. It's impossible. The definition of second normal form precludes the concept of even getting there. Now, the entire primary key is needed to determine the value of each non-key attribute. In other words, every column that's part of the primary key is required to be able to identify any other piece of information. Now, that means that there's no partial dependencies. Now, a partial dependency, and I will bring that up in a second, a partial dependency means part of the data is dependent on only part of the primary key. So, if we look here, we got subject code, section code, instructor number, instructor name, subject name. When we look at this relation, there's a few issues. The instructor name, for example, is dependent on the instructor number. The instructor name is not dependent on subject code or the section code in the class list. It's not. Therefore, that's called a partial dependency as per this definition right here. Attributes whose values can be determined by knowing only part of the key. So if I go back over here and we look at this class list example, the instructor number is attached to the section code. Therefore, the instructor name is dependent on the instructor number. The instructor number is dependent on the section code. The subject code has nothing to do with the instructor. For example, you guys have two different lab instructors. It's still CST8215, but there's section 301, with this, which is Cheryl, and then 302 through 304, with, which is with me. That means that the name of the instructor is totally relevant to the subject code. The instructor number is relevant only to the section code. So that's called a partial dependency. And only part of the data depends on the primary key. This is the whole primary key, like this. That's the primary key. This part of the primary key determines the instructor. So that's what's called a partial dependency. And if you don't understand something, please stop me. I will not feel offended. 
Now, on this class list, the subject code and the section code and the student number, those are the primary keys. The student name is dependent on the student number. Is the student number subject to the subject code? No, because the student really belongs in a section. So this piece is the only dependent on this. So the partial dependency is the student name is dependent on the student number. Student number is connected to section code. So student number to student name. Student name is partially dependent on student number. Instructor name is dependent on instructor number. An actual subject name is also dependent on subject code. It just so happens that there's multiple partial dependencies in here. So if we want to break it down to cycle normal form, and I'm actually going to do an example on the board in a bit. Um, when you create a new relation, consistent part of the primary key and all the attributes whose values are determined by this part of the primary key. For example, we now have something called subject. So we came back from this huge list of things to now a table called subject code and subject name. This table only has two columns. This is fully dependent on that and nothing else. So that table is now officially in second normal form. And technically, if you really want to argue about it, it's already in third normal form because there's no, other, there's no more things you can do to it. But it's second normal form. The student has been broken down into student name and student number. So now we have a subject, a student, and then what we want to do is take the relation we were just playing with, with the class list student, and subject code, section code, and student number. So the subject code refers to this, the section code refers to something that's not on the screen, and the student number refers to the student here. So suddenly we've got this list of relations. And once I'm done, you'll, uh, it should all be up on the screen together. And then, in the end, you have the class list. You have the subject code, the section code, and for some unknown reason, the instructor is still here. Nobody's taken the time to separate them out yet. But we will be taking care of that in the third normal form. So, so far in second normal form, we have, we created two new entities like this, which has dependent values for this here, dependent value of this here, and the class list student has had the student name removed, and the subject name has been removed, and it just refers to the subject and the student, and the section code is referring to this guy, so now everything's happy, which leads us to the third normal form. All right. Another big definition. A second normal form is in third normal form. And what do you have to be before you can be in third normal form? You have to be in second normal form. Why? Because that's how you could become a blue Saiyan. Right? You've got to go from the you know, first guy to yellow to, you know, whatever. Blue. Yes? No. It is in second normal form, technically. This is fully dependent. This chunk here is fully dependent on this primary key for now. Personally, I'm following an example that, was, that exists already. Personally, I would have taken the time to break this guy out right off the bat, too. Um, this is actually known as what they call, for third normal form, this is known as a transitive dependency. As in, this... Both of these currently are fully dependent on this combination. Because, see this instructor? It was never part of the primary key. On the other hand, if I go back a little further, if you look at it here, the student name is full, currently dependent on a part of the primary key of this table. And the subject name is part of this part of the primary key. So what we have to do is break it apart so that we don't have, hello, we don't have pieces in each of the relations that are only partially dependent on the primary key. 
The instructor number and instructor name was never dependent, was never part of the primary key because we never needed to know what the instructor was to find out what course the student was taking. Or we don't need to know who the instructor is to be able to determine what section a student is in. This just happens to be, you know, a piece of the information. So right now what we've done is we've gotten rid of all the pieces of information that are dependent on only part of the primary key. So the student name has been broken out to its own table because the student name was only dependent on the student number. And the subject name was broken out because it's only dependent on the subject code. So therefore we got rid of all that crap out of this table. And based on these references, we can identify the connections. And once you guys start playing with data later, when you actually play with the data, you'll see how that makes so much more sense when it's broken apart better. Yes? That right now, because the instructor number was never actually part of the primary key. It's, yeah, section code is. And yes, the instructor numbers depend on the section code. The instructor name is dependent on the instructor number. But the instructor number was never part of the primary key. So to get to second normal form, you get rid of everything that's not dependent on the whole primary key. Right now, this piece here, the instructor number, an instructor name is wholly dependent on this primary key for the time being. That's second normal form. We're going to actually address that in third normal form. So at the next level up, we're going to get rid of that. Yes? Once, the, once you get down to the point of physical design, yes. Normally, primary keys are not required to be numbers. They can be anything. Okay. Normally, you try to use numbers because they're small and they're fast. Okay. Databases are really good at looking up numbers. They're not quite as fast looking up through letters and numbers combined. However, a database can use anything for a primary key. And you can also have compound keys, which is what this is right now. And when I start talking about physical design, I explain why I hate compound keys. But for now, there's a compound key here and a three-way compound key here. The, that is a primary key in that sense that it's okay to have a compound primary key if there's no reason to not, um, other than performance reasons. The section code is unique, and the subject code is unique, like CST 8215, section A. Right now, the combination of these two together lets you identify the instructor. The combination of all three of these lets you figure out that this student in that section is taking that course. It's just a bunch of lookup tables. When you think about a student number, because it's just a pure number, yeah, of these guys. Yes. Essentially, these are associative entities, just so you know. Yep, that's exactly what they're for. So, now to get the third normal form. Oh, hang on. What I see on my screen is not what you guys see on your screen. Is, to be in third normal form, you have to be in second normal form, because it's impossible to be anything else. Now, when the primary key and nothing but the primary key can be used to determine the value of each non-key attribute. Okay. If I go back here, this is the primary key. The instructor number and the instructor name. This is what's called a transitive dependency. In other words, looking at this, do we need to know what the primary key is set the instructor's name? Yes, for now. However, realistically, the instructor name actually depends on the instructor number. And the instructor number depends on the primary key. So what's happening is this is a transitive dependency. Because this depends on this, which depends on that. You should not be able to go, this depends on this, which depends on that. Because then you got anything inside of a given table, should only ever, you should only ever be able to say, this depends on that, and then stop your sentence. You shouldn't have an and in there anywhere. So when I go back and look at this definition, 
That's a transitive dependency. In other words, an attribute whose value can be determined by knowing something other than the key. We can find out what the instructor's name is because of the instructor number. However, we don't need this to find this out. Thus, this is what they call a transitive dependency. Now to go from second to third normal form, these are our currently second normal form relations. And that's really small. Hopefully somebody's got down the, the PowerPoints on Blackboard. So um, the class list student, we've seen class list, we've seen subject, and student, we've seen. Now, in class list, this guy right here, the instructor's name is determined by the instructor number. So the name of the instructor is determined by the number. The number is connected to these guys. So what we want to do is we want to create a new instructor table. So now the instructor's name is fully dependent on the instructor number. And we want to remove the transitive dependency so that now all we have is a subject code, the section code, and the instructor number as the foreign key. So now we can still find out what the instructor is, their name by referring to this table via the value in here. So it's like you, like you said, it's another glue table. I almost just zapped you in the face with my little laser pointer. Because right? when you said it, I almost pointed at you. That wouldn't have been good. But essentially what's happened here is we've broken this piece off to be over here in its own entity. So in the end we have this nice chunk here of all of this is a bunch of foreign keys. Again here, a bunch of foreign keys. And then a couple of tables that actually contain the actual data. Everything else glues everything together. So in the end, our class list will look like this. So that original grid that I had for you guys with six columns ends up breaking into one, two, three, four, five different entities. Each of these entities don't have a small piece of what's on the outside. And one of the goals of, denormal, of normalization is to decompose invalid um, relations because they're breaking the rules. They have transitive dependencies or partial dependencies. You don't want those things. So the goal is, is to decompose your data in such a way that it now contains the absolute m minimum number of fields required to define whatever it is you're talking about. So when you look at an invoice, for example, you can look going across, and actually I'll use that as an example in a minute. Um, so like I said, the third normal form is you want the smallest bits and pieces connecting to the primary keys. You don't want anything that's not related to the primary key. Yes. Because the instructor is not required to figure out the subject and section. That the instructor's been assigned to it, but they're not required to figure out the subject and the section. Yeah. So as you insert data, the data of the application will take the time to, not the database, but the actual program you're typing stuff in, will take the time of taking that form, breaking it down to separate pieces, and shoving them into the right slots. And all, yeah, like I said, all you end up is you end up with three tables like this that actually have real data associated to a primary key. And the rest of these, all they spend time doing is gluing it all together so the data actually makes sense. Once the data is broken down this way, here's some of the nifty side effects also of normalization. When you properly normalize your data, it minimizes the number of um, data changes you need to do. For example, if I want the instructor changes their name for whatever reason, instead of having to go through that table and changing the name of the instructor everywhere, we change it here. And it will instantly be reflected on the section. Same thing with a student. You change the name of the student, instantly it's reflected everywhere else because you're changing the data in one place, as opposed to changing it all over the place. Same thing with the subject. And depending on the code, that the, some courses change names, so you want to reduce the number of places you need to change it. Yes? 
this right here? That's because they decided to call it subject code foreign key one. And instructor number foreign key two, they just got clever and threw on, I'm using somebody else's slides, and basically put foreign key one means that this is a foreign key, and this is a foreign key, and this is not a foreign key because that's part of itself. Subject code foreign key one, because it gets its value from here. Student number foreign key two, because it gets its number from here. The instructor number foreign key two gets its number from here. It's just they're giving it, they're getting clever with the names. A few of different ways we could write is to just skip this. You just put subject code here and instructor number here and skip the whole FK1. So that, that's, there's different ways of wording this and it actually depends on what you decide to do. As if you are going to start using this kind of notation, either use FK, FK1, number them, whatever. However, what the important part is subject code so that you know it maps out to subject code here. The only reason they're throwing this on here, at least for the example, is to make it clear that this is a foreign key and this is actually a primary key. So that's the point of the FK. It's just a naming thing. I mean, I could have called this, you know, subject code George. And then instructor number Jim. It's, it's all good. It doesn't care. This just, you know, the notation they chose to use. And this is, there's no set standard. They just decided for, and and I agreed with the slide for this, is that they decided to highlight the fact that this is a foreign key and that this relation has one, two foreign keys. This isn't a foreign key. They're just typing it in and same thing with this one. And honestly, personally, I'd actually have the section out separately, but they don't actually have anything but a code. So there's no other piece of information relating to it. There was another voice that started talking and not. Okay. You figured it out? All right. Now, there's things that you have to remember when you start normalizing stuff. I, and a single unnormalized user view, in other words, if you look at a set of data, will always result in one or more relations in first normal form. In other words, how we had it broken down originally with a big long grid where we had no repeating rows, that is a single entity, but we could have done it the other way around where we broke it into two pieces right off the bat. So a single unnormalized view will always be at least one more first normal form view. Each first normal form will always become one or more in second normal form. Sometimes it skips version, it skips normal forms. Um, and, you know, each second level become one or more third level. You must never lose an attribute. So when you're going through this process, you can't start dropping information because you decide it's not important. That should have happened before or it happens once you're done normalizing. But you don't do it as part of the normalization process because then you're losing fidelity. And losing fidelity of your data is a bad thing. They must always be found somewhere along the way. Uh, and the other rule is you can never lose a relation. Like before I said, you know, you can't lose an attribute as in we can't forget about the instructor's name. Well, you can't decide, well, to hell with the instructor. We don't need any of them. We can teach ourselves. We can't drop an entire entity either. Okay. Now. I am going to turn that off for a minute. And this thing keeps going forever. I don't think I'll ever understand why they use chalkboard erasers on whiteboards. Stuff's nasty. Okay, so I'm going to go through another example 
quickly. And we're going to break it down going across the board from one side to the other. I just want to make sure my camera's going to pick up the whole thing here. Good enough. All right. Get that out of the way. I can see my handwriting getting short, smaller and smaller as I was going. Okay, so, so far, I've got a relation. All right, so I've created a mess, essentially. It's unnormalized at this point in time. If I were to write that in that notation we had before, because I'll be erasing the board with every step I take, so I apologize now, is if I were to do this, we'd call this uh, All right, so here's our unnormalized relation. Currently, we have a repeating group, this one. So to get the first normal form, we need to get rid of the repeating groups. And how would we achieve that is we would <coughs> get rid of those repeating groups and actually turn this into just straight up procedure and over here
Actually, we don't need to redo these two. So in the lighter blue is, I've gotten rid of the repeating groups. But so far I haven't even identified what my primary key is. So as a group, can we determine what we need to figure out to find any given record? Okay, that's one. The doctor number. Are you sure? The date. Those are our primary keys. It's just like we we're dealing with the students where we had some repeating values, but they're, some of it's only partially dependent. So now we've got like this. So now what we have, we have partial dependencies. And our partial dependencies Are as follows. So this is in first normal form. Now we want to get it to second normal form, so we need to break it down somewhat. And actually this one here goes from second to third really fast. So if I were to break it down further, it would become something that looks, we need to create some new entities. So we create one called doctors. And another one called Patients. And the last one called um, Actually, I'm going to leave that one alone because this one here is transitive. So we have appointments and the rest of it. So I'm going to add one more down here so I can describe I guess I don't want, it's not Dorkter. <laughs> so, we've gotten rid of the partial dependency. And actual fact, I need to... I think I used, was it this one I used? No. This one? Yeah. I'm going to change this line for a second because it's actually dependent. I just should use it a different color for this. The procedure is fully dependent on those two. So if we were to redraw this, I'd have. So if I were to take this and decompose it, it would break down into the following relations. Yes? No. The procedure is not dependent on the appointment date because the procedure was applied to a patient by a doctor on that date. On the same date by the same doctor? Yeah, yeah. The It, well, you do. It's the, right now, it's currently dependent on all three of these. The procedure itself is what procedure was under the patient. And to figure out, usually, when did it happen to who and who did it. So this is fully dependent on these three. Now, 
currently we don't know what these procedures are. We don't have any numbers. We'd actually have to start inventing information that we don't have, which is not part of the normalization process. That's part of the you know information gathering stage. But this is breaking down this big, long, complicated one, and we actually did it in, you know, we skipped steps. Well, we didn't, but we partially skipped a step. And the biggest step we did was to bring it to first normal form, which was this. So the, everything is dependent on, at least on part of the key. In the second normal form, we got rid of the partial dependencies, and we didn't have any transitive dependencies in this case. Now, if we were to apply this whole thing where we actually had the procedure name included for the ride, then we have a transitive dependency. So I'm going to grab purple because I'm going to add that argument in here. So this became procedure. And if we had I'm not taking the time to invent procedure names. But at this point, what was happening is we had a partial dependency at this point. If we were going to throw on procedure name, because this is dependent on that, and why can't I draw arrows? This is dependent on those. So at this point in time, we'd end up with like such. <coughs> so now everything is in second normal form. This one's in second normal form, but it's not in third normal form because the name of the procedure is dependent on the procedure. The procedure is dependent on everything else. So this is second NF. These guys, because they're completed, this one's in third NF, same thing with this one, third normal form. This one's in second normal form. How would we resolve this, what's called a transitive dependency? Create a new table called Leave that there. And then we'd have to recreate appointments one more time. And now these, after this line here, is now in 3NF. So if I were to restate all of these, as that those slides like to say, restate, restate, and restate, I'll restate it on my little rolly board here. And I will turn it when I'm done.
And that's the final, my, with my terrible, terrible handwriting. That's the final restated version. So we went from that mess into four relations that are broken down to the smallest component pieces that identify any given set of information. So we can identify the doctor, the patient, the procedure name, and then this last table connects everything together. It's an associative table, and it connects absolutely everything together. Or you can do like some people, then run down with a cell phone and take a picture. Click, click, click. Yes. I can barely hear you. Can you just up your voice just like two levels? Um, that could be the result of a query coming back to be displayed on a, way, well, on a form, like in JSON data. But odds are what it's coming from originally is a properly normalized database, and then the code assembles it in a way that's usable for the web page. In the end, your goal is to try to achieve something that's like this, where any given entity only contains information about itself and only what it needs to know for itself. So each one is independent from all the others, except for the ones that are basically like child records, which are, you know, connected that way. Any other questions on that? It's got awful one. That's why you got a lab and the lab goes gets you to do to do to do gets you to do two of these. And uh, how many of you read the, the reading for this? Like I think it was chapter seven? Uh, for those of you that actually read it, some of this probably made more sense, which is why I asked you to please read Chapter 7 before today. That's why I assign the reading every week. Yes? It's almost the last part. There is one more normal form that's accepted past this. It's called Boyce Cod Normal Form. And Boyce Cod Normal Form states that Everything is dependent on the key and only the key. It's commonly known as normal form three and a half. It's a very small edge case. I don't spend a lot of time talking about it other than to highlight that it exists. Um, there's actually a pretty good definition in the textbook of what voice cod is. Um, the, the ticket is though, and a lot of people don't realize this, is that when You've achieved this, even though I'm saying this is in third normal form, this is actually in fifth normal form. There's actually more normal forms past Boyce Cod. There's fourth, fifth, and sixth. Fourth, fifth, and sixth have been created to handle specific edge cases, and we don't cover it at level one database. Um, to be honest, I do the database design for a living, and I've never really needed to go past Boyce Cod or slash third normal form. Um, like I said, fourth and fifth are for edge cases. Six that somebody needed to prove that they still needed to be employed. And they've actually created a couple more. I don't remember what they're called. There's, there's a bunch of levels that are just academic. Um, but this is the process for normalization from a table that looks like that. Uh, on the labs, when it's time to do the labs for this, you're going to get two different examples. One's going to have a set of information. The other one's actually going to have like a grid with data in it. So it gives you the aspect from two sides. All right, welcome to part two. Hopefully you've been able to collect your brains off the floor and put them back in your heads after the normalization because that one hurts. Yes. Let's just look at the week four slideshow. I realized when I did the week two, I ripped shit out of week three and moved it to week two. Suddenly week two was like an hour long. I mean, week three was an hour long, so I grabbed parts of four and put it into three. It's the joy of the, it's the, joy of the fact that we move stuff at a certain pace, but we're not, I'm not locking myself down to hey, we finished an hour early, we all go home. Not yet anyways, that'll happen later. Okay, I'm going to talk about physical design. So, so far we've spoken about normalization where, you know, we broke down the data in different pieces into set entities. And that's at the, what they call the logical design stage or the conceptual design stage depending whose terminology you want to use. Conceptual means you, you figured out the basic pieces of everything, all the entities, how they're broken apart, and all that jazz. 
The logical side means you've now broken it down to its component pieces. Then there's the physical design. And the physical design is when we get to the, to the nitty gritty of actually taking all that thinking we just finished doing and converting it into a format that works with a given database server. Now, there's some catches here. Every database server does things a little bit differently. They have different data types. They have basic different rules on how the data types behave. You know, you've got sane database servers like Microsoft SQL Server and Postgres. You've got broken database servers like MySQL, and then you have Oracle, which is somewhere playing in the sandbox by itself because that's how Oracle plays. Um, it has some odd rules, and it, it's a little irritating because they don't really follow anybody's rules. <laughs> Not even. Now, what they did is they got inside the sandbox, peed in a circle around it, and said, this is mine. And everybody else made themselves their own sandbox <laughs> and let Oracle play in its own by itself because that's just too gross to deal with. Um, okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about when I talk about physical design is synthetic, or if you remember my previous lectures, a surrogate keys versus natural keys. Now, I'm going to put out some definitions first because some of these you've seen before, but it's always good to have your definitions refreshed. A composite key, it's a key that's composed by two of two or more attributes. For example, when we were working with the denormalization, we had composite keys. Some of the tables had two, three, four fields as part of the primary key. That's called a composite key. A natural key. A natural key is a key that's formed from attributes that already exist in the real world. An example, in the US they have social security numbers. In Canada we have SIN numbers. You know, you have a credit card company that's assigned your credit card number. These are, you know, natural keys. They're natural identifiers. Now, as it says on the slide, no certain keys you don't want to use up as a primary key because there's privacy rules that apply. Now, a synthetic key, which is also known as a surrogate key, it's a key that has no business meaning. It has no relation at all to the real world. It's a make-believe key in the sense that the contents of it only exist in the database. It's only within itself. It doesn't exist outside the database. It's a built-in reference. The primary key is what basically is the preferred key for a given entity type. So we have entity types of students. And in this school, the preferred primary key is student number. And then a foreign key. It's one or more attributes in an entity that represents a key of some sort. But their value comes from another entity. In other words, if you have a field that's defined as a primary key, whatever value goes into that little box is actually created somewhere else. So those are the different kinds of keys you'd see during design. But now I'm going to talk about the issues with natural keys. As you can see, there's all kinds of problems with natural keys. I, I, I hate them with a passion. And believe it or not, this is not my slide. I grabbed this slide off somebody else off the internet. And I can't remember his name, so I can't actually attribute. But he was so good because he covered every single point I hate about them myself, and a lot of people agree with it. Con number one, the size of the primary key. Generally, surrogate keys don't have a problem with index size because they're usually a single column. That's usually a number. Numbers are really easy to index. They're, they're fast. They work well. They don't take up a lot of room. The problem with natural keys is they can get really, really long, and sometimes you end up having to use compound keys to make it work, which means these keys are really brutal. For example, at the school, your student number is actually fairly long, but if you realize, you know, it starts with four and a bunch of zeros, realistically, it's actually everything after that batch of zeros is actually your number. Everything before that, they don't care. It's just, you know, at one point in time, that four had meaning, and I think four means Woodruff Campus. I think in Pembroke, that first number is different. And in Perth, that first number is different. It identifies your campus. So at campus number three, your student number blank. It's actually still fairly short because it's only a number. Now imagine if, for example, you use a credit card as an identifier. And 
the credit card is, what, 12 digits long? Realistically, out of those 12 digits, maybe you're only customer five, because you know, you're the fifth customer to sign up for that credit card. But there you're gonna use the credit number, and the credit card number is your identifier, and it's 12 digits long. It takes up more room. That's a, that's a really simple example. Now imagine if you use something else like somebody's last name plus their postal code plus their phone number. That takes up a lot of room, and it's a lot harder to work with than, you know, client number 53. Two, foreign key size. Everything I said about the primary key, rinse and repeat for the foreign key. But the problem then is that the table has the foreign key, has its own primary key too, so your keys are just getting huge and they take up tons of room, making things extra complicated. People can understand cross-references between numbers, but when you start cross-referencing three pieces of information every single time to, add, to find another whatever, it's pretty bad. Okay, imagine you went to the store and you bought some furniture at Ikea, some of that shitty furniture they sell. Actually, it's gotten better in the last couple of years, but it's still crappy furniture. But you bought some crappy furniture. Now imagine back, did anybody here remember before we used to get the nice little receipts, we used to actually get like an invoice, depending on how you bought it? You'd actually get like a wide form invoice. Now imagine every single time they needed to, you needed to do a return for whatever reason you bought one too many beds. And you decide you need to return the extra bed. And the only way they could find your orders, they looked you up by your last name, your phone number, and the date of the transaction. And they need to type that in every single time they want to find any given piece of information for you. That'd be terrible. That's the problem with the foreign keys. They just get huge. If you're using just a number as your primary key, guess what goes into the foreign key? Just the matching number. Number three, aesthetics. Now, it's an eye of the beholder thing. And I will admit it right up front. I don't know. Looking at just for a number seems to be so much nicer than looking for, you know, name, address, and telephone number. It's just gross when you have to deal with that. So dealing with just a smaller number, it's visually easier. It reduces the amount of complexity in your tables. It reduces the amount of cascade. So everything looks neat and tidy. Four and five. Optionability and applicability. Surrogate keys have no problems with people or things not wanting or not being able to provide the data. Now, I always use an example of, anybody here ever heard the phrase of, of stateless person? It's a big thing in the states where they declare themselves to be a country unto themselves. That's the other name for it. Yes, they call themselves sovereign citizen or stateless citizen. And they declare themselves being a country unto themselves and nothing of the country they live in applies to them. That means you ask them, what is your SIN number or your SSN number? I don't have one of those. I'm a country unto myself. Okay, therefore, I guess you're not getting a job today. But notwithstanding that, you know, they don't want to provide the information. So let's just say you're a police officer giving this guy a ticket and he asks for your identification. The guy goes, I don't recognize any of your forms of authority. Well, you can still probably get whatever name he gives you without any of the rest of it. You can still write the guy a ticket. On the other hand, the sort like the sort he doesn't care. He'll get no ticket number, you know, 49,513. There you go. Ticket. You're able to create the ticket without the rest of that information. It doesn't apply. So it allows you to make more of your data optional. Even though really you don't want to make it optional, sometimes life happens and you end up making things optional because that's just how the data is out in the real world. And same thing with applicability. Sometimes the data just doesn't apply. Imagine if they required every student to have a Canadian SIN number. Well, that doesn't, therefore, that the Canadian SIN number doesn't apply to foreign exchange students. Therefore, that becomes optional. But if you were using that as your primary key, what are you going to do? You create a synthetic key, and you make that not mandatory. Number six, uniqueness. Synthetic keys are always guaranteed to be 100% unique. Why? Because they usually auto-increment. They automatically give themselves a new value. Every time you, assign, you create a piece of information, it automatically assigns a new value to it. On the other hand, 
if you were using other pieces of information like, I don't know, last name and date of birth, you can't guarantee that's going to be unique. Even if you do last name, first name, and date of birth, or last name, date of birth, and city of birth, still doesn't work. I know that for a fact. Some of you have heard the story where when I was born, a girl was born, less than a couple minutes later, had the exact same last name, born at the same hospital on the same day. Go cap. <laughs> uh, but if you were going to go based on last name, date of birth, and city of birth, she and I are the same person. Therefore, that's not even a, a valid key. On the other hand, a synthetic key, you're baby 13, I'm baby 14. You know, at least you've been tagged with a unique number to identify you at that point. Okay, as you can see, the list keeps going with the problems with natural keys. Privacy. When it's a surrogate key, who cares about privacy? It's a number. It has absolutely no meaning other than I can use you to find you in the database. If you use a social security number, can you imagine you're going to the bank to go withdraw money and they say, hey, can I have your SIN number so I can pull you out of our records? And you sit there and you go, my number is 477641 blank, 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 blank. And then everybody around you just heard your SIN number? Congratulations. No. Don't do that. For privacy reasons, surrogate key is the best because they're totally irrelevant. They just, they're just a number. And depending on how the database is built, you know, you could actually back up the database, restore the database, and these numbers would all change. It's all, all work, but the numbers would just change. Accidental denormalization. You can't accidentally denormalize. And I don't talk about denormalization until later in the term. You know how I just talked to you guys about how to normalize? There's a side where you take a normalization and break it apart and make it shitty again for a specific reason. Um, but sometimes when you denormalize, you end up breaking stuff. Non-business data has no meaning, therefore it's not something you risk losing. Cascading updates. Surrogate keys don't change. That means if you need to, if you're using a person's last name as your primary key, and then in the child table, you know, their, their name is being repeated down here, that means that if you were going to change this row, you also have to go change in the child records, and you end up with this weird chicken before the egg business. Where which row am I going to update first? Because they're all related to each other. Things break. When you're using those kinds of keys, you can change every other piece of information except for the keys. The system doesn't care. It just works. And then the last one. VAR card join speeds. Now, you guys don't know much about joins because I haven't taught it. That much I know. Let's just say... If you were going to connect two pieces of information and use numbers, what do you think would go faster? You connect record number five to record number five. As opposed to, you're going to connect George born in 1975 in Hearst to George born in 1975 in Hearst. The database server has to interpret all this information. And then it's got to loop through the other records until it finds all the matches. Whereas if it's looking for numbers, it's going to go, Five. I know where five is. It's right there. Whereas if you're doing this weird compound key with lots of information in it, it's actually got to loop through the whole database until it finds all the bits and pieces you need. It makes cross-referencing much faster. Okay. Synthetic keys technically have disadvantages too. Okay. Purists complain about how it's hard to get the next value. Bullshit. It's censored on the slide, not censored out of my mouth. 98% of database servers out there support auto-increment in some form or other. It's a non-issue. But you'll hear, you know, the purest database designers saying, you shouldn't use synthetic keys because it's hard to get the next value. The natural keys will provide it to you automatically. Whatever. It's literally, in Postgres, you create a field with a type called big serial. Boom. Done. In MySQL, you create a field that's an integer with a property called auto increment. In Microsoft SQL Server, you create a, a type, an integer with a type of, uh, with a, a property called identity. That's a lot of work. 
to make this work. Oracle sucks. Oracle, you got to create the table, then you create a sequence, then you create a trigger to assign the That's where they're all complaining about. It's because of Oracle. Oracle's gotten better for that too, but literally this, all these complaints were because of Oracle. The second complaint is that users don't understand these synthetic keys. I go to you and I say, you're number 53. They go, well, I don't know why I'm 53. Who cares? Why? That's your number. Accept it. That's who you are. Or whatever your student number is, 4000 and then whatever. How many of you don't understand the concept of your student number? Like, honestly. If anybody here admits that they don't understand their student number, that's pretty bad. But, you know, keep it to yourselves. <laughs> You're laughing. But I'm serious. Uh, that's probably something you don't want to broadcast. Your student number identifies you to the school. There's not much more to understand past that. But one of the complaints about the peers is that end users don't understand these numbers. Really, we don't care. They didn't have the time. They never even see them. They shouldn't be looking at them. They're just there, happening in the background. So when you know you load up a web page and got to try to come up with something simpler than Facebook as an example, because Facebook's horrifyingly complicated. Um, Spotify. You're using the Spotify web client. And you know how you know you've got albums you're following, and you go and you're looking at your list, and you click on the name of the album. Really, behind the scenes, there's a number attached to that that says, "This is the album ID that Dan is following today." That's hidden. Do you know what that number, magic number is to tell you what album you're following at a given time? No. Do you care? No, not a problem. Extra obtuse joins. People complain that the joins get obtuse and complicated. Occasionally it happens where having you know synthetic keys makes it more complicated, but it's so rare, it's a non-issue. And realistically, if you've been typing SQL for more than three months, it's a non-issue. At first, it's complicated. Extra indexes. Now, this is the only valid complaint I can honestly say. Now, if you're using natural keys and you're going to put index, and this is a concept I teach later also, but indexes are a way to make things get found faster. So you always have an index on your primary key, always. It's just how it works. Your primary key is always indexed. So let's just say your primary key is made up out of your last name, your date of birth, and your phone number. Those are information you tend to look people up by really fast anyway, so those are always going to be indexed no matter what. So if you throw a synthetic key into the mix, you add one more index. So that means, let's say you're not, if you're using natural keys, you'd have three indexes. You use a surrogate key, you have four indexes. It's, it's a non-issue. It's the only closest to a real complaint for synthetic keys or surrogate keys is that you have to create one extra index. Woo. Um, it takes like 15 seconds. Okay. So now I'm done ranting about natural keys and versus synthetic keys. The design process. The design process is an iterative process. Oh, crap. I'm running out of time. I'm going to have to keep track of where I am. <laughs> the design process is an iterative process. There's no perfect quote mark design. Reaching for perfection usually causes more problems. In other words, it's entirely possible to keep designing and designing and designing and designing forever until you've achieved the perfect design. Where you want to track what books you have on your bookshelf and you end up having enough, inf enough information to track every author on earth where their books are in every freaking library and every bookstore. Because theoretically, if you just kept going and going, eventually you'll just keep adding stuff that you don't need. Most design processes, it's made up of four steps and then an end of process review. Step one, depending on the source of the data, there's two common paths. There's the recreation or slash the dirty word, reverse engineering. In other words, somebody gave, there's a system that already exists, they provide you with the information and then you recreate it. B, or path two, clean room implementation. Clean room implementation, implementation means somebody had an idea. 
and they say, I want this. And then you go, do you have any examples? No. Okay, then we're starting from scratch. We know nothing about the system. They each have their pros and their cons. One has cruft, one has lack of information. So one has almost too much information, the other one has not enough. However, they have very common steps. Step one, identify all the possible gross data objects. These would be the entities. Users, customers, orders, you know, pets, that kind of crap. And then you list all the objects and you categorize them. So you break them down into smaller pieces. You figure out what the bits and pieces are. Then you describe what all these things are. So each of the objects, you're going to add some basic fields. You know, you're going to add your primary keys, a descriptor field. Uh, you know, if it's an order, you're going to add an order date. Maybe if it's how it was shipped. All the information that you were able to gather during the identification process. And you try to identify as much as you humanly can at this stage. Like you just go nuts and identify as much as you humanly can. Right, and then once you've found that, you assign some data types, so some basic data types. And I actually talk about data types at the end if I make it there. Relations. So now you've got your gross objects. You make connections between them. You figure out things are interconnected. Sounds a bit like when I was talking about the logical design, right? It's the same thing. It's just you do the logical design and you're also going to do some of the physical stuff as you go. Um, you identify which projects, uh, projects, which objects are both parents and which one are children. In other words, you need to figure out the cardinality. So a customer has orders. A customer can have lots of orders. Each order belongs to a customer. So we figure out our cardinality at this point. You figure out which relations are mandatory. What must you supply? What pieces of information are absolutely mandatory? Must you always require them to provide you with a province? Yes or no. Must you always get them to provide you with a country? Yes or no. Should you get them to provide you with their gender? That's a sensitive one. Yes or no. You create the foreign keys as needed. So at this point, no, you're going to start drawing. And actually, next week, I'll be actually doing an on-the-board design session. So we can go through the whole thing from start to end. Step four, what we just finished talking about. As you're breaking things down, you're going to create reference tables as you need them. In case you don't know what a reference table is, a reference table is a table that's used to contain set lists of values. How many of you have filled out a form on a web page in the last month? Okay, how many of those forms had something that looked like a country or a province? Country and province. They come from a set list. They don't change that often. Unless you're in Europe, then it changes all the time. But it's true. They can't make up their minds. However, in general, the list of countries doesn't change very often. The list of the subdivisions of each country doesn't change very often. These are what they call set lists. It's good that you can actually maintain the lists. Those are known as reference tables. They usually have two columns or two or three, right? You have a primary key, you have an identifier of some sort, and then maybe whether or not it's active or not, a true false field saying, oh, Yugoslavia no longer exists. It's now six countries, five countries, and soon to be six at the rate they're headed. So, you know, Yugoslavia is no longer active, but it should stay in the database because maybe you had information that was created when Yugoslavia existed. Otherwise, you have to take the time to go through the database to clean up everything that used to be Yugoslavia and break it down to its component pieces. So when you've broken down your, your table and you've done the normalization, you would break, you'd break out those fields that would actually be part of, a norm, of the reference tables and you create them as a new entity with a foreign key. It's a bit like we did with uh, the example I had up on the screen, which the instructor it's a list of instructors. Therefore, we're going to take that out and we're just going to put in the instructor number. That way it's a cross-reference. Step five is the review. You review the design for potential issues. And at this point, hopefully you can actually ask a peer, please review this unless there's an NDA or you don't have any peers that do database design where you work. But normally you'll ask, you know, do you mind taking 
you know, look at this fresh pair of eyes. Then you explain to them roughly what it is. Um, and after you've identified any weaknesses, you start over at step one, but based on what you currently have, and you iterate and you iterate and you iterate until you achieve a certain point where you're planning for the future without over-engineering. You know, you want to go from here to Canada, you don't need the space shuttle to achieve that. You need a bicycle. Don't overdo it. It's not necessary. And this is when I put in a, uh, a moment on the side for one of my favorite techniques of if I can't ask someone to take a second look at it. There's a technique called, called rubber duck debugging. And a lot of people say, what the hell is rubber duck debugging? You get yourself a little rubber duck, literally, or something like a rubber duck. Pick your favorite little thing. And then you talk to it and you explain to it what everything is. And if you can't explain it to the rubber duck in plain English, you done screwed up. And it's the same thing for debugging your code. You have your little rubber duck and you explain to the little rubber duck, hey, by the way, this is what this loop is doing. And as you're telling the little rubber duck, you realize you're out to lunch. It's called re rubber duck debugging. And in this case, you could call it, call it the rubber duck peer review. It works great. Mine's a little, a little Einstein guy I got on a friggin' Happy Meal. Why? Because it was sitting on a shelf at home and didn't belong to anybody. So I grabbed it and I put it sitting on the corner of my window in my office. So when I need to explain something, I explain it to Einstein. I know he's smarter than I am. <laughs> Therefore, you know. So that's the design process. There's not a lot to it. It's just iterative. And you take everything I've taught you guys so far and you apply it in steps. Now, as one of the steps of the design process was choosing some data types. These are also known as domains. Depending on what stage of the design process you're in, it's known either as a data type or a domain. They're interchangeable. Except the only difference is between data type and domain is domain is the primitive types, the data types are the precise types. For example, a domain would be characters, number, integer. Actually, that's pretty much, you know, date. When you talk about the data types, you're talking about more precise things, sort of, is it a small integer, a large integer, is it a float, is it a decimal, what's the precision level, is it a varying length character field, is it a, you know, a massive text field, is it a two character field. That's the difference between data type and domain. So when you choose your data types, you've got to take a few things into consideration. How big is the data? How, is, how big do you think it's going to be then add 20%? Take my word for it. it. That's probably not even enough. Is it numeric? Are there decimal places? So you, as you're looking at your data types, you know, you look at that. If it's a date, you should probably include the time because Murphy's Law would state you release a fantastic database system that's fantastically well engineered and then they ask you, what time did that transaction take place at? I don't know. It happened yesterday. <sighs> so if somebody asks for a date, always include the time. You can always get the date out of the time, but you can't invent a time out of a, just a date. How many of you have had that experience? When, the, when did that happen? I don't know. Yesterday? So that's when you spilt the coffee into your laptop bag? <laughs> I picked on him right now. Uh, if it's text, how big is it? And then there's something called blobs. That's when you deal with binary data, such as pictures, music, videos. And I say just say no to blobs. Don't store the binary data in the database. It's stupid. Store the file somewhere on the disk and then store the path to the file in the database. Why? Because most, most paths on a file system is 255 characters long, at least on Windows. 255 characters, right? So that's 255 bytes. My phone takes pictures that are 4 megabytes. And it's a shitty phone. So you could store so much more information in the same place. Now, what happens when you use blobs is if you store it in the database, your nightly backups get bigger. Let's say you got a thousand rows that have four megs of data. You're sitting at whatever the hell it would be, four, 400 megs, 40 megs, whatever. 400 megs sitting there, occupying space. So every night you're backing up 400 megs. 
If you're just storing the file name, which matches to a path somewhere, your back might be like 50k. Then you can use the file system to actually back up the, the binary, which, you know, there's really good software that are backup file systems. You know, they've been only have been around for 40 years. Whereas if you do a backup with binary data in it every single night, it dumps to a file, then that file gets backed up, and it changes every single day because it changes every single day. That means instead of backing up only the changes, you're backing up the entirety of the database every single day. It's bad. Blobs are like drugs. Just say no. They're tempting. They make life easy. And then you crash and burn. Now, I'm going to go through some of the data types really quick because i got 10 minutes left. I'm going to go specifically to the Postgres ones because that's the database we're using. A lot of these data types carry over to other database servers, more or less. There's char, char also known as character. It's for a fixed length piece of text. Postgres says don't even bother use these. The actual developers for Postgres says don't use these. There's no point. But a lot of traditional database designers like using them anyways because they're, they're historical. It means that if you define, say, a postal code is six characters long, that postal code will always occupy six characters in the database. It's always that set width. It, the database server knows exactly how much room it needs for it every single time. On the other hand, there's the varchar, also known as character varying, which I had you guys doing in the diagrams. The character varying stores the number of bytes in the string plus one special character at the end, a delimiter. So let's just say you store a person's name, and the guy's name is Dan, but you're allowing up to 25 characters. It'll store three bytes plus, you know, a couple of bits to identify the end of the field. And then the rest of the data keeps going from there. That's the difference between a car and a var car. Var car takes up less disk space. That's the only difference. They essentially do everything the same, except one occupies less room. That's it. Text. This used to hold huge chunks of text. Postgres has no practical limit of how much you can actually shove into a text field. Uh, you're limited by the limitations of the file system that it's resting on. So on a Windows file system, you're limited to 8 gigs of text per row. It's a little excessive. MySQL, on the other hand, is the special child. It needs three different ones to handle it because it can't do it all with one. It's got a small text, a text, and a large text. The large text holds about a, two -thir a third of what Postgres's text holds. The small text holds like 500 bytes. Why? I don't know. It's kind of dumb. Okay, Postgres has numbers. Postgres is freaking awesome at numbers. It's one of the things it does best. It's got three kinds of integers. Two, four, and eight byte integers, also known as small int, int, and big int. Or also known as int2, int, and int8. Depending what tool you use, it'll show up differently. That big number is the maximum size you can shove into an, int, an integer field. And actually, someone on reason, my ne the negative sign is getting wrapped. That dash there is supposed to be a negative. So it goes from negative whatever the heck that is to positive whatever the heck that is. It holds a lot of values. Decimal and numeric. It'll allow you to have 131,072 digits before the decimal point and up to 16,383 decimal points of precision. And in case that's not enough for you, you can use a double precision, also known as a float. So if 16,000 decimal places of precision is enough, you can go more precise than that. Whatever. Serial and big serial. They're integers. There's, there's known as what they call a meta type. Really, it's a, either an int or a big int that auto increments. So when it actually gets physically created, it actually is an integer, but it has some extra properties applied to it. Nothing special. And then there's money, which is if you look at the numbers and if you're good at identifying patterns, this number is the same as that number, except there's a decimal place before the last two digits. In other words, a money will hold the same thing as a as a eight bit eight byte integer. It's just only two decimal places, which 
means gas companies will never use money because gas is a dollar nine point three. So they actually go, you know, three places of precision on the decimals. Uh, data types continued times timestamp in MySQL. This is known as a date time. In Microsoft SQL Server, it's known as date time. Timestamp's the same thing. I got two slides. I'm trying to get them done in four minutes. Timestamp is eight bytes. It contains both the date and the time. It can go back to 4,713 4, BC to, I don't know, something way in the future. Uh, dates only does the date, except you can go further into the future with it because it's not reserving space for the time. Time without the date, guess what? It tracks the time. And they got one other data type called interval. Interval's cool. Interval counts the number of, mi of microseconds between two events. It doesn't tell you when it started and when it ended. It just says this ran for this many microseconds. It's kind of cool. OK, there's a few quick other things that are important. Check constraints, which some of you do in the labs have discovered. I don't have the instructions on how to create them for that lab. Check constraints. They exist for integrity reasons. They ensure that a given row only matches the rules that are applied. So that means you don't allow a number greater than less than zero. Stuff like that. Uh, rules can have multiple conditions. And the format of a condition is something you've probably, have you guys learned about if statement set in Java? Yeah, one said, one said no, one said yes. You haven't yet. Okay, which is why some of these slides are hard for me because you haven't learned the concepts behind it. But it's, uh, basically, it's a column condition value. Price is greater than zero. So when you learn how to do that in Java, you'll be able to do it in Postgres. Uh, last couple of things you got to worry about. Whether or not a field is null or not null. If it's not null, the value is required. If it's null, it's not required. Uh, the check constraint, you can create, I just discussed that in a previous slide. And then there's something called default value, which means if you don't supply a value, it shoves that value in by default. So if you say the default value for the timestamp is now, every time you insert a record, it'll put now into that field. That's it.